question would then be, do we have a regulatory tool to just go after that, or maybe we'd have to just go after a broader set of things. Um, I think since our agencies have such different mandates, our answers to this are going to be pretty different. Yeah, and for us, we're just charged with protecting wildlife and human health. So it's really the linkage to, again, what's causing it. If we can lump them all together and make a meaningful relationship, then you know, we can do this again. But I think the reality is that the data is a little bit different, a little bit more complicated. So finding that balance between you know, splitting hairs and are they you know, causing more harm, does it matter? Um, because if you look at our chemical consumption data for a thousands of those, and we are now considering them all lumping them together, and separate them with PCBs, and trigger 200 different exosomes. So it's, it's not unreasonable to say we could break it down in the same sort of granularity, but I think we're looking to see, well, how does that relate to the potential impact, and then to make that decision. Good question. So uh, this is just to sort of raise the concern that we tend to um, uh, we tend to focus on particles that are bigger than sort of 10 or 20 microns um, because that's sort of the limits of our ease of detection. Um, but I have this concern that you know just as with small air particulates that it's the smaller particles that we should be worrying about that if we are not if everybody's shying away from looking at things that are sort of in the small microns and nanoparticle sizes, mm -hmm. um, we may be missing the real, the really, you know, important and, and, and potentially highly toxic. So that's kind of one of our main issues with chemistry and analytical chemistry is the ability for your instrument to detect down to a certain level. And a lot of people in the regulated community find it really frustrating when the analytical techniques improve, and yet we might not have the necessary you know, tools to understand what that means for human health or for life standpoint. Mm -hmm. But if we have the toxicity and the analytical abilities aren't down there yet, it's a different problem. Mm -hmm. So we have the ability to regulate down to whatever we can reliably report. And there's um, that's where acceptance ranges come in and all of this mm -hmm. sort of <coughs> certainty or uncertainty around your data come in. But yeah, I think what we've done traditionally is when Maybe the analytical techniques aren't there yet. We start here, and like with, I keep talking about PFAS, but we just lowered the notification level because they knew it was a human health concern. And Sorry. The analytical I'm techniques aren't going to be as well. So. I was wondering, you mentioned that um, by 2021, we need to have a standard for drinking water and we go on like the different steps including like an intercalibration study. Have you guys started that? Is that the study that's going on with SWARP right now? Yeah. So there's the study with SWARP and then I just found out the EPA is doing it with ASTM as well. Um, but I'm not, they, I was at a conference earlier this week for a lot of and they mentioned it but they said there were no confidentiality situations. But yeah, the SWARP one we know and the EPA ASTM should be coming out soon. Uh, I'm on that ASTM uh, for, for uh, microplastics, and uh, there's a big focus on wastewater. I'm not I'm not familiar with the, the drinking water component, but it's a lot of um, chemical confirmation methods, such as FTIR and NAMI. They're standardizing for those, and, but everything from collection to digestion to analysis. Have you guys um, contemplated the category question? How you're going to bid things? You know, I just joined, and our <laughs> big meeting in December. Okay. So I think a lot of that will be uh, discussed. Uh, I've seen some of the drafts. Mm -hmm. not, not the I'm just curious what you guys think of um, how citizens. I think especially with plastics, I feel like there's 
a way in which it's so accessible to the average citizen, people can see it, it's easy for them to understand when you compare it to say a chemical like PFAS. Um, plastics are much easier for people to understand so they want to do something about it or they want to go out and try and collect it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I feel like the, the quality assurance end of things is hard. Um, I haven't done a lot of like direct work with citizen science groups before, but do you think they could potentially do field lines when they go out and do their collection? Totally. Yeah, so I mean, I, I feel like that's a great place for them to start in terms of the quality assurance. Yeah, I, I was gonna add too, so you can think about it in two, two ways, like all of the QA, QC involved in sample collection, and extraction, and all that, and then the QAQC involved in identification, and mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, nonprofits are ready to go by, you know, micro FTIR, so maybe you know, that's a little bit separate issue, but um, as we're, we're, the field is developing, we're starting to think more and more about QAQC practices, I think that we're, we're coming up with some good summaries and good steps to include, like definitely, no matter who you are, when you're going to collect samples, make sure you do have a field link. Make sure you do have a lab link, and and at least having a framework of a QA plan, a rough QA plan. I think that's becoming more accessible. We just need to get the word out and you know, to maybe a little bit more of a consensus on how to do that. And then we're also working on making sure we get the data back or have opportunities to see data and systems to put it in because with a lot of our emerging data sets, it's kind of <coughs>
so we've been in air, we've, well, Mary should speak to this, but we've been using um, a one micron filter, basically, and um, with Nile Red, we've been identifying very small particles on there. The size of those tiny particles. Oh, what we've measured? Mm. I've, we've only gone down to, I think, 20 microns. Mm -hmm. For the light stuff, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, so. But there's a whole constellation of smaller things that we don't, we I don't think measure. We, could, we, just count. we could go down farther. Yeah. Is that the high volume kind of multi stage impact? Yeah, and the, the, the sort of, we're screening out things smaller than one micron, basically. So, or we're losing, you know, we're, we're not searching for things. Well, so I mentioned sort of our agency in some ways being behind the time, but from our perspective, we're looking for methods that. I mean, they're really sophisticated. We have a lot of municipalities and police work in the place that, you know, get on the budget. And so getting them in yeah, yeah, the, the equipment, um, you know, an electron scanning microscope, all that equipment, the reality is it's probably a little ways off. So we're looking for sort of methods that you could say, yeah, this is important. We know it's an issue, but somebody could go and implement it in their routine monitoring. And then as you guys are finding that's when, you know, 10 years later, they <laughs> come in and be like, now you can do that. But we get a lot of pushback for cost of compliance because we live in a world where it's additive, right? You know, they have the legacy of getting the humans, they have the mouse. Now we're opening a can of the CDCs. Um, we started requiring to try our political screening tools for some monitoring. And so, again, this additive thing, we're feeling cities hit the sort of limit. And as Violet said, they're the receiver of all of our waste. They're not generating it, but they've been charged and tasked and um, legally responsible for hitting compliance limits. And so the monitoring, all of that goes back to the house. And so that's a discussion that our board has of ways to consider implement monitoring requirements. But that being said, from the perspective of if that's really what's driving the toxicity or the impacts of human health, that's when we have a better argument for saying that we need to do this versus you know, we're still in that sort of investigatory screening phase. And something to add, you know, that I hear a lot when I have internal discussions um, at OCSD and, and speaking to managers or in other wastewater agencies especially, a question comes up a lot, like, so what exactly are the risks? Like, what exactly are the effects? What, you know, and I'm always like, well, it depends, you know, on this, on the size, and it depends on the organisms, and it, you know, we found we found some effects and some risks, but I can never be like they're super bad; they will kill you. I'm not. I mean, I'm not going to say that, um, but we don't know. And I think until the science is more defined on the effects and the environmental risks, you're going to have resistance. I'm an environmental scientist, you know, so I see it a little bit differently. I see it from both perspectives, but you'll get a lot more resistance and managers who definitely definitely will not want to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a micro FTIR. Right? 70,000 or whatever they are, if we don't even know that the risks are there and obvious, you know, mm -hmm. I think they're, we're getting there, but that's a push to say that I think we need more, definitely more science on that end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I'd say to your comment on the, like, nano side of material, but I felt when we were doing our emotional litter strategy, we were trying to look forward to the next six years of what we would be working on, and at the time I felt like you know, the nanoplastic size was just, it was in a state where I couldn't put an action for our agency on it yet. Because um, when I looked back at like the 10 years prior when we had done our first litter strategy, there was this one little mention of microplastics and it just said that, you know, microplastics are plastics that break down into small sizes in the ocean. And that was all they said. <laughs> um, so, you know, the science advances a ton and, and in the interim, so I'm sure that's something we'll be looking at in the future, but it just wasn't quite at a place where we could uh, give ourselves some solid actions when we drafted that document. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important that we work with you guys because um, I think some of the, some of the conversation at, at meetings in recent years has been, oh, you gotta use this much more sophisticated tool and that's what you have to do. And indeed, a lot of journals now are saying you have to have some type of FTAR or ramen to use the term microplastics in your publication. But 
for example, this summer when we're running various samples through with various instrument makers. Um, the the super whiz bang Brahmin sucked, you know, quite frankly, and it and it, it just because of the the nature and diversity of the, of some items, it didn't work well. Others worked very well, and so so there's this. The, I think it's a really key point that um, we need to work for practice, you know, things that are going to work in the right now or in the next year or so, because I think sort of we academics sometimes go down this rabbit hole and and don't really understand how it will be used and and even some of the the um, the efficacy of some of these more sophisticated techniques they're looking at lab generated samples pure PVC and this and that not the stuff that's weathered and has these films on them and all this kind of craziness and so I think that the practical um, collaboration is, is really really key and I think that's also one place that we the academics can help folks in that um, I don't think everybody needs to go buy a $150,000 FTIR, but the goal is when we have them to begin to make them available and, and so that people can send samples and, and that type of synergy I think is how we'll get to the next, um, you know, the implementation of stuff, I think. That's a great point. I, I would also add that um, with the, the cost of everything, Whatever method is chosen, there, there's going to be a lot of more research and mm -hmm. validation of these methods where mm -hmm. you have a confidence level mm -hmm. of that method. And so you may have an error range for a purely visual method of, I've seen, 70% uh, in, in some literature. And so you just take that and you use that in uh, your final analysis. And this is my confidence in this number and comparing it to another method that may have a, a higher degree of confidence. And so you have to take the, the quantities of microplastics and, and weigh them with that confidence in mind. Totally. Each totally. So we're right on time.